it's Kristen with Collision Hub and it's Repair University 2015 live from NACE in Detroit. And well, there's been a lot of talk about aluminum and what it takes to repair aluminum and equipment, but we've noticed a lot lately that there's still a lot to be learned around steel and repairing steel correctly and even having the proper equipment to do steel. So Larry, let's talk about steels. Oh, we're back again. Yeah. You know, I, I tried asking Mopar earlier, this happens to be a Chrysler 200. I said, can't you produce cars like this, you know, in this color? It would be great. I need uh, three reds, uh, two oranges, and one blue. And that would make life so much more simpler. It would make life simpler as a tech, knowing I could just grind down and realize what Right, I really, oh, I know what color's damaged. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the nice thing is the manufacturers are uh, making these bodies and body and whites, they're called. Uh, in colors at the trade show so we can get photos of them and explain better what uh, what goes into these uh, structures nowadays. It's really a capsulation of protection for the, for the occupants and then obviously uh, we've seen the crash videos where they've changed now the frontal offset hit to really um, missing the front bumper reinforcement and trying to hit really the upper right. rail and the A-pillar and that's really sent a lot of vehicle manufacturers trying to revamp the structural capabilities of their vehicles. And I know we've talked before that the front portion of the car, the first, and once again, this isn't a standard, but you know, the first few inches are meant to crush rapidly, the next few inches are meant to slow down the collision, uh, the last few inches before the, the uh, uh, instrument panel or dash panel or the uh, 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 firewall is supposed to now start transferring that energy towards the back and vice versa in the rear of the car. Well, they've had to come up with different types of steels to be able to manage this type of structure. And to make it manage better, they've had to strengthen up the passenger compartment area. And this is where we're seeing all these colors nowadays. And, and you're seeing from the manufacturers uh, on the steel cars, you're seeing aluminum in the front, aluminum in the rear, steel in the center area with some aluminum parts. Steel cars, still all steel, but now you're getting some more thinner steel and we're seeing less reinforcements because of the use of these advanced high strength steels or ultimate high strength steels and each company classifies them slightly differently. This is why I've told Tex you need to understand what the megapascal or, or, or tensile strength is so you can classify where it falls into a category. Right. Because the Americans and the Asians classify it the same. Different. Europeans classify it differently, so when you read a manual, it could be different, even though you're talking about the same type of material. So let's talk about that a little bit, because I we had a comment the other night. You know, you and I, we, we play around on some of these groups on uh, social media. Sometimes you and I get in a little bit of trouble <laughs> on those, but there were some mentions about mild steel, and you know, we know that we haven't seen a whole lot of mild steel on a car for the last five years, even including fenders and quarters are going to more high strengths, more advanced steels. So let's break down really quickly for the audience what are several of the types of steel that I'm going to run into in the collision repair industry? To this day, it's still classified the same as mild steel uh, classification. Your next classification would be high strength steel. Your next classification would be ultra high strength steel. Because of the different types of steels they've brought in, there's two or three categories of mild steel, about seven categories of high strength steel. So you have a low grade, medium grade and a high grade. And then of course, ultra high strength steels have been really split up into high, ultra high strength steel, uh, advanced high strength steels, or extreme or extra high strength steels. And that's where you're starting to get your press hardenable steels like your uh, uh, Martensite or boron alloy steel, which are at the top of the food chain. Uh, most of your out of body panels are still going to be uh, mild steel with the Americans, unless they're aluminum, which is uh, uh, getting in there now. Most of the Asian vehicle makers, they're not using aluminum, they're using high strength steel. Although a lot of the quarter panels are quarter panels and roof panels are still mild steel. It's when we get into the structure that that all changes. And this is especially important because there's close tolerances between let's say the outer rocker and the inner rocker. So if I have a dent on the outer rocker that's covering this area, I may only have one or two millimeters of area before it makes contact with a, a, a stronger piece of steel. So if I have a dent that looks like a three, four hour repair I can pull out, this might be dented behind it and you don't even realize it. So you have to understand by the vehicle maker's locations and materials 
where this part is, what, what, how far the distance is, and uh, they actually give you sometimes measurements of the distance between flanges, so that's important to know right. also. So let's talk a little bit about where the OEMs use these steels and why. So the construction theory on it. So this is a great entry-level sedan from Chrysler, commonly sold. It's not high-end, it's not European, it's not an exotic. And in a small area on the side of this car, well, we've got three different types of steel just right here within the, the reach of each other. So tell me a little bit about what the OEM's theory is behind design and what they're thinking of when they're making these components. Well, you got to remember that the OEMs are poised with the issue of making the, the cheapest product to produce, the safest, and the most fuel economically. So they're, they're trying to make that happy mix of price premium, cost effectiveness to build, safety, and then of course fuel economy. In this case, with this particular car, uh, and, and I know it's an entry-level vehicle for Chrysler, this is not much different than your E-Class Mercedes-Benz. It really isn't as far as structurally going. If I had a, a, a Mercedes-Benz put alongside of it, you'd see similarities on the construction of the vehicle, just like you would see the similarities with a, a Chevy uh, that's an entry-level. In this particular case, they've utilized, and, and the colors on this, the, the reds on here are press hardenable steel, or what that's what they're calling it, which is really Martin side or boron alloy steel. You're talking uh, a material that's got a 1200 megapascal rating, or uh, um, in PSI, it's uh, in the area of 175,000 PSI. And, and you can see your upper B pillar, and if you feel in here, there is no reinforcement. Okay, you go, you put your hand in here and you feel around. There's no reinforcement. So this is taking the place of two or three layers that we normally had in less weight, but 10 times the strength. Same thing with the A pillar, the upper outer roof rail. And you do know Chrysler requires all their panels to be well bonded back together, regardless how they put them together. So this is another consideration for the shop to look into. Down here we have advanced high strength steel, and you can already see this a couple of layers of advanced high strength steel. This is what bumper reinforcements used to be made out of, but nowhere near the same thickness. You can see the thickness of this is much thinner right. than what our bumper reinforcements used to be. This stuff here is about 800 uh, megapascal, 116, 120,000 PSI. Now, that goes back into this area over here where we have uh, more of this advanced high strength steel and it's overlapping. There's beads in here to give it lateral stiffening for strength. Now you come over here, this, old, this particular part here is a high, a high grade, high strength steel or high strength low alloy steel. So the rocker is the same color as the firewall. Obviously the firewall is going to be a much weaker material, probably thinner. This is probably a high grade close to 700 megapascal, which is about 100,000 psi, when the firewall is probably a lot closer to 300 megapascal or about 45,000 psi. And then that's attached to this piece of boron alloy steel. Now on the inside, completely in here, everything on the floor pan, the cross members, and even the inner reinforcement area happens to be your uh, advanced high strength steel of 800 megapascal. So the car is a very strong car. The idea nowadays is not to have this area crush and shorten the passenger compartment area or, or shorten the width of it. It's meant to come in here dissipate the energy here, straight up this B-pillar across the roof rails to the other side. That's what it's looking to do. And the seats a lot of times, the bars in the seats are usually made of boron alloy steel, the crossbars, to transfer all that energy onto uh, the center uh, 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 tunnel or the transmission tunnel, in this case a center tunnel, it's a front wheel drive vehicle. So that's what they're looking to do is keep the occupants protected so you don't look at a car and see a seat this wide, say, oh my God, I hope no one was sitting in there. So this is where all these steels are coming from. And there's another important factor with a lot of different vehicles. We don't know what's in there. And in this particular case, and you can right. see people are doing this all the time, they're walking over here, there's all foam in here. Right, the whole cavity, so from right, right. here at the So the from here all the way to door. about here, right. and then back here, you'll see it's all got foam in here also. So that means any damage to the center of this rocker is probably not repairable because one, it might have damaged the higher strength steel, but now you have a problem, you can't heat anything because you'll set this foam on fire. It could smolder for a while. Behind there, if it catches on enough fire, it heats up enough. There's usually wire harnesses in here, and you can see there's access holes here that have foam. Right. That catches the wire harness on fire. The tech's working on it, heating it up, and now the car's on fire, what do you do? And you may not know about it for a couple of hours. So this is where uh, the locations and materials from the OEM website what's in these uh, panels, what they're made of, 
what's the repairability of them? That's where it really comes important for important fashion. So for example, if I have two doors that are hit and I need two doors, right? Little da no damage on the quarter, no damage on the fender, and the B pillar's in two millimeters, that's not put the car in the frame machine, tug the B pillar real quick, a little hammer and dolly work, change the two doors. That is, this piece has to be changed right. because the advanced high strength steel shouldn't be pulled. Anything above 600 megapascals shouldn't be pulled. And I'll even be honest with you, 600 megapascal is very difficult to pull anyway. It's got a lot of spring back and doesn't want to move. But the hinge is attached to the boron alloy steel, the monsite steel, here and here. Once these move, this whole thing has to be changed. You can't pull it. And you can see a lot of the areas, there is no weld bonding material in here. When you replace it, you have to weld bond it. So you really have to plan out the things properly when you do get involved in these new advanced structured vehicles. Right. Now this vehicle is a great example as you look at the different steels and where they are in the car, because when they come into the shop, well, they're all painted the same color and they look the same. This lets us know specifically how the car is designed to protect that occupant, protect the passenger, and move that energy around, which makes repair and replace more than just an ep an, a question of economics, but really a question of safety. So Larry, this car is also a great example for us to talk about how we join different steels together. So the old day of dragging my welder over and putting a part on the car, kind of over, because of these overlapping different metals in repair. What are some of the typical joining methods that the collision repair, because obviously we can't laser weld, we can't go back like the factory. What are the typical joining repair methods that a collision repair is gonna run into with high string steels? Sure, Kristen, uh, one quick thing. This is a Chrysler. I'm not giving exact Chrysler procedures. I'm gonna give a few different ones, just so everyone realizes I'm not doing a Chrysler class here. Uh, Chrysler does require weld bonding. In many cases, Chrysler, for example, when you section, where you're gonna cut an outer panel, um, uh, like on the sail panel or in the rocker panel, the outer panel, they're gonna make you bond that totally. It's a full bonded procedure with an insert. Uh, uh, BMW, for example, does the same type of thing. Now, BMW weld bonds a lot of their panels together, and they also do a lot of resistance welding. In the aftermarket field, which is what we're in, they require rivet bonding to put the car back together. Mercedes-Benz, on the other hand, does uh, 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 welding at their, their facility, only does rivet bonding where aluminum meets steel on some of their cars. And then in the areas down on the rocker where the resistance arms can't reach both sides, because you can't do single-sided welding, they make you just do riveting by themselves. Then you have your conventional mag plug welds, your mag fillet welds, or your uh, uh, mag uh, lap-on uh, lap fillet welds, or open butt joints, or butt joints with backing. You'll also see resistance welds, or a combination of anything. It's a rarity to get a steel vehicle with just bonding outside of door skins, but you do have some manufacturers that have roof panels that are laser welded on. And in the aftermarket <coughs> field, what we're gonna have to do is, usually the side rails, when it meets up with the unicide, they'll go ahead and make that be bonded, either with some sort of bonding adhesive, or funny enough, urethane windshield adhesive if it's strong enough and then the front and rear window openings they'll make your resistance weld so each company has its own different procedure some of it sounds really crazy some of it doesn't and the old uh, uh, rule of thumb was if it's you know like icar used to say years ago uh, and icar said this doesn't hold true anymore if it's welded weld it back on if it's glued glue it back on if it's well bonded well bonded back on no it's not you have to find out what the manufacturer wants because if you if not, you could have a serious problem with some liability and, and people's uh, uh, better welfare and stuff like that. So it's important to find out what they want you to do to their car and how they want you to do it. Yeah, now a lot of that is beyond liability. So we get a lot of questions when we're talking about repair processes. It goes, yeah, you could do it that way, but y'all are just, you know, you're scared about a suit or maybe the OEM's scared about a suit. But there really are some true reasons, especially when dealing with high strength steels, why we don't do certain things. So Larry, what happens when we do it wrong, when we repair something we're not supposed to repair, or we replace a part with a wrong joining procedure? What happens to that metal? The, the thing you do have to remember is you can do whatever you want. And uh, uh, we always say you can't do that, you can't do that. Now the manufacturer says you, you shouldn't do that or doesn't recommend that. You can do whatever you want in life. The problem was is back in the, the you know, prior to the 2000s, cars didn't rip themselves apart. For example, this boron alloy steel piece of Martensite steel, if I heat this up and I try and pull it and move it, one of two things are gonna happen is, one, I'm heat treating it, so I'm making it stronger, which makes it more brittle, which causes more cracking. 
two is if I put too much applied force on it, what's going to happen is it's going to start to crack and break immediately and break out that piece. But let's say I get away with it just the right amount that I don't crack it now, but now it's more brittle. In a sub subsequent collision event, it could crack faster, cause the airbags not to deploy. Uh, uh, because you've weakened the part. So the car doesn't allow you to do it the wrong way. Now, if I go ahead and heat this whole area of these two much higher strength steels and try and pull it and it's not right, and it starts ripping apart from the inside and I butcher it back together. If you're in some bad roadways, like we see in New York and uh, 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 New Jersey, central, uh, eastern New Jersey, the roads are bad, you know, potholes, the car will start ripping itself apart. It, the cars don't allow you to do incorrect repairs anymore because they don't last anymore. Guys who uh, try and pull vehicles incorrectly in the back, a lot of times they wind up with like a lake or a pool in the trunk because of the fact that we have this <coughs> issue with with the water getting in because the seals are so tight and if they're not exact, you're gonna wind up with a problem. So welding tabs on panels to pull them, if you're using wiggle wire or you're using the copper pins or one of the copper tools that are given to you in your dent removal system, that's usually okay. Uh, or you're welding you know, 40, 50 pins, putting a bar through there and pulling out. That's usually okay, it's a much lower temperature. You're not doing a full fusion to the panel. But when you take a mag welder and you weld five or six spots and you weld it on there, even ICAR has in, in written material that says whatever you weld onto is no good anymore. The, the other thing you have to realize is guys like to do that like in the dog leg area and weld on. The problem is this is usually bonded here, inside and outside, because of the way the flange goes around. Then you got all that seam sealer. That becomes an issue. It gets weakened when you heat it up. And you got to remember, when you weld something together, it's 2,700 degrees it has to get to to actually make that weld on there. Your dent resistant, uh, your resistant dent pullers or dent, uh, you know, dent pins don't get that hot. So you're mag welding it on, you'll destroy this, these particular types of metals and you'll cause them to be weaker. In some cases, you might rip holes in them. Now what do you do? You have to do more, uh, lack of better wording, butchery to get them that way. So you really have to be careful on how you, what you, how you re, reaffix the parts together uh, on the vehicle. You have to follow what the manufacturer wants. An important part to mention in that is that a lot of the replacement procedures that we have are beyond just the joining methods, but being right at the right places so that we don't change the crash safety. So we have convolutions and designs in the panel for a reason, so we can't just go sectioning where we want to to make a cheaper, faster repair. No, situations. you can't take a general sectioning procedure. You know, the, the big fallacy is you need advanced frame equipment, you need measuring equipment, uh, you probably don't need that much pulling equipment. Most of this stuff can't be pulled nowadays. Most of the vehicles nowadays are a mount on a machine, measure it, chop and change whatever doesn't line up. All right, you're doing very, very little areas. Can you pull a vehicle nowadays? There's very, even on a steel car, there's very few pulling areas or areas you can pull or structure. And even when you have that, you're only really pulling for a short amount of time. It actually takes five, six times the amount of time people think to set the car up on the machine, put the fixture jig, temporary, you know, apparatus to hold the parts in place and measure the car than it actually does to actually pull because there's very little pulling. A lot of it is just chop and change type procedures, but unfortunately a lot of the industry doesn't know that already. Right, and it's one of the most commonly misdone or inappropriate repairs that we see. It's not aluminum and carbon fiber that's causing our problems, it's our steels yes. that are really messing us up these days. So as you can see from this car, it's a great example of all the different types of steels that you're running into on everyday cars that are in your shop. Following the OEM procedures isn't just a suggestion, but it's critical not only to doing the proper repair, but for keeping that occupant safe in a future collision. Remember, no matter what comes through, even how small the damage might look or feel, always review the information from the manufacturer. Know what substrate you're working with and what is allowed by that particular manufacturer on that car and keep in mind that it varies by manufacturer by model. So what may be okay for one particular Chevrolet car might not be okay for another. And it's always good that you check it. If you have any more questions on steels, the differences of steels or how to repair them correctly, well, you can always reach me and Larry on the website. And we'll be back with more episodes of Repair University.